Welcome to the joy of coding. Hello and welcome to episode 200 and what is it? 273 of the joy of coding. It's so good to have you here. My name is Mike Conley. It's December 15th, 2021. It's the special holiday episode, the last episode of 2021. I want to thank you so much for being here uh, to join me on this special episode of The Joy of Coding. I'm wearing a hat, a special hat. Unfortunately, it's it, it, this is my like um, uh, you know Christmas holiday elf hat and uh, the green. I, I completely forgot that the green is not going to go so well. It looks like part of my head's transparent. So we get some cool transparency effects in today's stream. Uh, did not plan for that, but hey, let's go for it. Um, all right, what are we doing today? for our special holiday episode. Well, like I said, today is December 15th, 2021, and it's the last episode of the year. And it's a special episode because uh, I wanted to take some time today to do two things. We talked about this in, in some previous episodes. The first one, there's a film, a short documentary about the birth of Mozilla, effectively. Uh, they didn't know it was going to be the birth of Mozilla at the time. I think they were just following around... Uh, the Netscape folks just to see what was going to happen. And it turned into like the birth of Mozilla. I, I don't actually know if, if they knew what was coming when they s decided to do the documentary, but effectively the documentary captures the birth of Mozilla whenever it started to get spun out of Netscape. So the documentary that was made is only an hour. Long. It's less than an hour. Um, and it's licensed via, I think it's creative commons license. So don't at me lawyers it's totally fine. I'm going to watch it with you and I'm going to pause it periodically and we can, you know, discuss what we're seeing. I'm not going to go for any cheap shots about, you know, people's haircuts or like, oh, everything looks so old because it's like the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on like some of the technologies that are mentioned, some of the history I'm seeing with respect to Mozilla and web browsers. So I thought we could start there and then uh, we could also... Uh, play this game that I found that I made when I was first learning to program. It's a pretty cringy game, so like prepare for cringe. Because I was pretty young when I when I made it, and uh, I was just figuring stuff out. So the performance is awful. Uh, the graphics are pretty bad. The gameplay is it, it's like ripping off a bunch of different things. It, it's just I thought it'd be fun to look at you know some of where I came from as a programmer uh, and share some of the cringe with you. So that that's the plan. Now, before we do this, the the links that I'm I'm gonna include here. This is all part of the agenda. I should make sure that you have links to the agenda. So, if you're watching this on YouTube, check out the video description for a link to the agenda. If you're watching this on uh, Air Mozilla, it's in the details section of the uh, the video over here somewhere. And if you're watching this on Twitch, then the uh, the document link I will just paste into the Twitch chat right now agenda and uh so yeah the other link i should include is the link to the game it's on github um it's actually called lost 2 i think <laughs> because the first game i i'll explain when we get there i'll explain when we get there so let's start with code rush um now throughout all this i'll be monitoring the chat in case people have questions about code rush or, or about you know the game that we're going to play um, so feel free. It's very free form. If you've got a holiday sweater, if you've got like cookies, go grab them. This is going to be a very relaxed episode. Uh, let's, let's start with Code Rush. Okay. So Code Rush, uh, I'm going to be watching it on Vimeo for change of pace because I feel like we always go for YouTube. So let's try with, with Vimeo today. Uh, and what I'll do is, is there a way I can, I'm going to full screen this. So I'm going to be kind of in the corner here. I hope that's okay. And I'm just going to monitor and make sure the sound's coming through. I'm pretty sure it should. So hold on. Let's pause here. Let's read this. From March 1998 to April 1999, an independent documentary film crew followed a team of software engineers at Netscape Communications as they lived through a watershed moment in the brief history of their company and the internet. Oh. Is it playing? It's playing. I talked to lots of people who 
come here look now hold on a second just let me know if the volume is 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 right if you need me to turn the volume up or down let me know oh. looking for the silicon valley experience they arrive with one suitcase in hand when they head south on the 101 hoping to see it this place they've heard about and it's freeways and it's office parks and it's strip malls and it looks like every place they've ever been. They end up wondering, where have they come? Why did they come here? What was it that brought them? The code itself is the underlying thing that makes computers work. Why is it important to the world? It's because it's the blood of the organism that's our culture now. It's, it, it, it makes everything go. You know, technology has become a god of our society now. I mean, I think that people stand in awe. All right, let's pause for a quick second here. Uh, because I'm already seeing some stuff that I recognize. You know, in this blurry photo, or in this blurry still, I can see, uh, I can see some words I recognize. Dist, public, um, you know, that's a, that's a, we still have those uh, directories created whenever you uh, do a build of Firefox. You have something called uh, uh, slash JS, so the JavaScript engine, public LDAP, the LDAP library that was written for Thunderbird and, you know, CMO, like the Netscape suite would allow you to like communicate with LDAP servers. And so there's an LDAP library written in C. And I guess under the public directories are where all the public interfaces, the headers and whatnot are. Uh, this might be a hook or book. I don't know. Could that be? I'm not sure what that is. I'm seeing if there's anything else I recognize in here. HTML something lib font that sounds familiar lib font pref the pref system so things that i still recognize it and the, i mean stand in awe of the people that make it look at that date march 31st 1998 so the game we're going to be playing later I'm I'm probably working on this that game right around now, maybe a year after. So uh, you know, we're we're digging deep into the '90s here. There's a sense that software is a kind of new frontier. You know, it's the old gold rush metaphor, the California gold rush all over again. It's the kind of Hollywood of the '20s. This very small set of people is really defining what our world's going to be like. I mean, if, you know, the computer becoming ubiquitous and the way we interact with the world more and more mediated through the computer is this very small group of people defining what that world's going to be like. Less than three years ago, a small team of engineers at Netscape Communications created software that made surfing the internet easy and in the process, changed the face of computing. Right, so late 90s. So we're talking about the dot-com bubble. Um, you know, I was just kind of becoming aware of the internet at the time. You know, I was using it to learn how to program with BASIC. And, uh, you know, Netscape was part of that whole thing. People were getting really excited about investing in what the, this newfangled internet thing. We also saw back there, I'm not sure if you saw someone on the back of their shirt has this sort of green dinosaur looking thing. That was like the original Mozilla like dino. That's what it looked like. Almost like a like a children's TV show character. Um, yeah. On this day, however, the company is in big trouble. Driven to the ground by its rival and software colossus, Microsoft. Only a radical strategy will help save it. Let's hear a little Mozilla. Mozilla. <laughs> Netscape is giving away its source code to programmers outside the company. The source code is the secret formula for browsing the web. Okay, so another a bit of context here. Like, the, this, this voiceover person, this voiceover guy is like, they're going to give away the secret code that they use to make browsing the web easy. Like, it sounds kind of silly to us, maybe now in 2021, but you have to think about how radical it was to give away source code back then in the late 90s. You know, the Linux kernel existed. 
You know, the, the open source was not like there was source code available on the internet that you could download and build, but it certainly wasn't like the sort of as ubiquitous as it is today. I think we kind of take it for granted just how much software that we use today has its source code available somewhere. And it might not be uh, the, you know, the full source. It might be, you know, an a variant, like an open source. Like the Chromium browser, for example, is not the same as Chrome. Chrome is a closed source um, variant of Chromium. Um, it's pretty similar to Chromium, but it is it is a closed source variant. But like the idea that so much software that we exist, Firefox, the Linux kernel, you know, the the various browser engines like Blink and WebKit and Gecko, and then you've got you know just the the myriad of things on GitHub and Bitbucket and um, you know all of these. It used to be SourceForge. People don't really use it much that these days. Like GitHub and Bitbucket, mainly GitHub have kind of supplanted that. But like, it's it's so widely available source code that it seems strange to think what a big deal they're making out of this. But it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal to open this stuff up. It was radical, radical stuff. The code is named Mozilla, and if widely adapted, it will make Netscape's code the internet standard. So this is interesting. I I, I want to not. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time interrupting and chatting, but like he said something else there. He said the code is named Mozilla. And that's true. There was like this overlapping, if you think of the Venn diagram. I wasn't there. This is this is me speaking as someone who wasn't there, but as someone who's been involved with Mozilla for an, like almost 10 years now, and I've gotten a, a handle of some of the history, there's this like overlapping sense of like the, the code is called Mozilla. The platform was also called Mozilla. The organization was called Mozilla. The actual product that was produced was also called Mozilla. Like they, they were all, it was all the same thing. Um, you know, you didn't have, you didn't have Firefox yet. Certainly you didn't have, um, you know, I don't know if they called it Gecko but it was just all kind of called Mozilla. And the idea that you could build an application and like a, a separate application on top of Mozilla, like they they kind of referred to the code base as like a platform you could build things on top of. Like I built this with Mozilla. It was like a framework almost for building applications. Drawing users to its other products and restoring the company's sagging fortunes. Our story focuses on a team of engineers who will come together in this building. Over the course of the next year, they will turn their lives inside out to create Mozilla and battle a giant competitor to save their company and shape the future of computing. So intense. Right now we have a problem with the work. Let's look at this hardware here. Big old CRT. Um, you know, you've got uh, uh, a tower here sitting underneath it. I'm pretty sure I saw some CD CD drives there. They might even still have floppies uh, going on. That's the era that we're in. Big old mechanical keyboard. No one's walking around with MacBooks, that's for sure. I don't even... I don't... At this point in time, I'm not sure if, if Apple's made its big comeback yet. Um, like, maybe someone can check, check on that. I, presuming this is around 1998, I don't remember whenever Steve Jobs came back to Apple and kind of turned it around because he was doing, uh, was it Next Step? He had left Apple, formed Next Step, worked on like the new version, like this new operating system, this new hardware, Objective-C. He started working on that with his people. And that was actually the platform that Tim Berners-Lee built the first, you know, kernels of the web on was a Next Step machine. And then uh, Steve Jobs then went back to Apple, brought some of that technology with him. And Mac OS is actually built on top of what started as Next Step, um, the, the, that operating system. Looks like it can't possibly be done for the date we announced. So we're just trying to drill down on how good we are. And sometimes the only way to do that is Get everybody in a room and stare each other in the eyes. We said we're giving you Netscape Communicator on 331. So if we're not giving them Netscape Communicator on 331, we need a way we, to address that. We can't do that. anything about it right now. And we're working to rectify The goal that. is to get Mozilla to developers by March 31st, a few short weeks from now. 
It is one of the most ambitious schedules in the company's history. It's a joke. I think we've been very explicit about okay. that. When you make a mistake, correct it as soon as you can. That's all you can do. Now we've now timed out on my imaginary allotted time. <laughs> Michael Toy, one of Netscape's first employees, heads the team that will prepare Mozilla for public release. Yeah, that's the other thing. It's like it's not like they have to create source code. What they have to do is they have to open it. Open sourcing something is not as simple as just like removing the private flag on a repository. There's a lot of work that goes into making something open source because presumably before it was opened, the source code probably had a bunch of like various licenses associated with different components that didn't necessarily um uh weren't compatible with being open sourced you know and that means rewriting those parts so there are, think of it as like well if we want to open source this thing we also have to like rewrite huge chunks of it in order to make it possible to to publish it openly and those things that we rewrite have to work properly you know so all right let's keep going We're probably missing 331 would be a really bad idea. We're probably doomed. We're probably going to fail. Microsoft is probably going to squish us like a bug anyway. But just because we're doomed, it doesn't mean. <sighs> Isn't that so interesting looking back? He's like, oh, Microsoft's going to squish us like a bug. Now, it's true. Microsoft did end up causing Netscape to evaporate. But Mozilla did not get crushed by Microsoft during this browser war. In fact... Uh, I mean, spoiler alert, uh, like they're being crushed by Internet Explorer right now, being bundled with Windows. And, you know, there's that in antitrust suit happening uh, with, you know, monopoly uh, uh, antitrust suit happening with Microsoft versus Netscape. But in the end, and spoiler alert for the folks who maybe didn't know, Internet Explorer did not win the browser war. Um and I'm not saying that Mozilla won it either. I, th I think everyone won in that no one person at this time, like at, whenever, um, you know, sort of at, I'd say within a couple of years of this video coming out, uh, you know, in the mid 2000s, what happened was that, you know, Firefox gained popularity. Internet Explorer kind of started to plateau a little bit and drop. And suddenly... You had this diversity growing. You had a growing diversity of of browser engines being available, and that was always the goal: is a diversity of browser engines. Now, these days is a different story. You know, think about these days. What have we got? We've basically got like the vast majority of browser engines on the internet now are using Blink, or uh, and to a, sm a lesser extent, you've got WebKit and Gecko. And I mean, and even WebKit. Blink used to be WebKit. They're they're related to one another. They were it, Blink is an offshoot of WebKit. Um, Google forked WebKit some number of years back. So when you think of how many like original like browser engines there are from the early days remaining, it's basically WebKit and Gecko. That's who's left. WebKit itself is a a very uh, I think it was. Um, based off of KHTML, and that's what powered Conqueror, the browser that came with KDE. Um, it's funny to think that KDE became WebKit, became Blink, <laughs> and is like the sort of a, the the dominant the uh, the the dominant browser engine for us right now. It's fascinating. All right, let's keep going. You know, we can't get up in the morning and, and do work. All rise. I mean, I'm pretty flip with my kids about what I do. What do you do at work? At oh, I don't know. I, I sit in meetings and I feel depressed and I read email. Oh, oh, you got me. Oh. But they think my office is the greatest place in the world, though. It's like, oh, we're going to your office. Oh, yay, yippee! I love going to your office because they, you know, they play with the guns and there's free soda and there's the giant balls. Basically, I work at Disneyland as far as they're concerned. I talk about marathon versus sprint. The hard part is to run with significant intensity the whole way, knowing that if you ever start, walk, start walking, you're not going to make it. And just keep the end in sight and know that there's this urgency. Jim Ruskin, an expert on software security, is brought in to enforce rigorous standards of engineering precision. Imagine if you had a project where you felt 
doom was imminent. All the different players wondering, are they pushed beyond their level? Can they think of a way of running faster? Can anyone help them? So there's, there's a lot of tension and anxiety over making this schedule. I'm going to pause for a second. I want to back up and look at some of these machines that we're, think of a way uh, of running? we're running on here. What is this? This might be one of those like silicon graphics machines from back in the day. I don't recognize this operating system. So if anyone recognizes this operating system, let me know. Faster? Can anyone help them? So there's, there's a lot of tension and anxiety over making this schedule. And you can see that's like clearly Netscape in the background there. Jamie Zawinski, free source code evangelist, will enlist outside developers to Netscape's cause. The free source thing is, is trying to change the rules, right? There are people who have the free software religion. The one thing they have in common is they're all hackers. You know, they all you know, like writing code. So hoping to tap into all of those smart people and, and get something from it, you know, so that everyone benefits. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Danny Cole says it might be Sun OS. He asks if it's Sun OS. It might be. I don't even know if I'd recognize Sun OS if I saw it. Now we're talking about two million, two and a half million lines of code, and every one of them has to be gone over carefully, and in some cases twice. Ah, okay. So what we're looking at here, uh, this is a screenshot of what we, uh, what used to be called Tinderbox which was the old continuous integration system. I think I may have even mentioned it a couple of episodes back. Um, continuous integration, as I understand it, was actually invented by Netscape. Um, the, the whole concept of continuous integration. And the way that we used to visualize jobs running on a machine was using this tool called the Tinderbox um, viewer, I guess. Uh, it was basically just a series of tables that would periodically update and, and show you progress as jobs ran in parallel. And what also is interesting is I see a name here, D. Vedits, that's Dan Vedits, who is still working at Mozilla today. D. Vedits was doing some work, clearly running some jobs. So I think that's kind of neat. Okay, I think we're ready. With hundreds of engineers converging on Mozilla with new code to enable its release, Tara Hernandez makes sure that their changes do not crash Mozilla and bring everyone's work to a halt. This is how we keep track of all the changes that are going in. Uh, green is good. Yeah, this is this is Tinderbox. This is Tinderbox. So it sounds like, uh, sorry, what was her name? Uh, what, Tara what? Hernandez. Tara Hernandez. She might be what we would consider these days a release manager or uh, you know Relenge or something. Um, I'm not sure if that was her title back then, but you know if that's her job or tree sheriff maybe. Um, and maybe it's any, maybe it's all of these things, you know, maybe she had a number of these roles. Um, but that's, that's what I would think of today. If, if her job is to make sure everything is like green. A lot of changes going in right here and wham, the builds all died. Okay. All right. Bye. No, 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 no. We're doomed. Some of the worst crashes are reserved for Scott Collins, a veteran code writer who stands by for late night troubleshooting. I've been here for about, uh, I don't know, 60 hours or so. Writing software is different from um, selling real estate. Selling real estate, you sell to people, the people are asleep at night. When they go to sleep, you have to stop selling real estate. Computers never sleep. We're in the finals. We're going to win $10,000. You can see my cube is decked out a little bit better than other people's. I have a nice couch, little mattress on under there I can sleep in. Artwork for my children. I have control of the light switches. This is what I'd like to get if my wife truly loved me. She'd let me have one. Life is good. Pretty old school. Pretty old school. That cubicle um, is like something out of office space. No offense that guy he sounds he sounds like he really enjoyed it but uh it's pretty old school also sorry did he have a couch under for sleeping on <laughs> wild okay that counts all right um there are a ton of bugs in here that and they're printing out bug lists <laughs> mm. wild now i've i've been in meetings like this but we definitely don't print them out you know, this is, it sounds like what they're about to do is triage. 
you know, and trying to make decisions about bugs, what stays, what goes. The idea that they printed it out is wild to me. People just aren't doing anything about. To give away its code, Netscape's engineers must make thousands of bug fixes, often minute changes that will allow the code to be used by outside developers. Jeff Weinstein has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. One bug hidden in the mass of code can stop everyone else's work and threaten the ship date. I need someone to pay Jeff Weinstein and get him to call uh, 2024. Even a team of 20 people building a car, it's easy to step back 40 feet and look and go, hold it, that guy's not putting on the wheel. You have 40 programmers working, they all come to you with code, a gigantic morass of little details piled up on a disk. What are we seeing here? Recalc origin Y, grid origin width, button. This is UI code, I guess. Usually you can't even see the pieces, whether they're doing it correctly. You have to assemble it into the hole and then see if the hole works. Probably, and then you're not just, even sure who gave you I the bad it. bits. Oh. <laughs> that would be bad. Let's go downstairs. Come on. You, know, you talk about a recipe. Who gave you the bad flour? Someone went out to grind flour, and they had to all be exactly the right size chunks of flour. Someone else made chocolate chips. They all had to be the right size chunks. You can't figure it out until you put it all together. You hand it out, and people go, I don't like the way this tastes. Okay. And now you have to wonder, with all these details coming together, which was the problem? Who's causing the problem? How can you fix it? You've got to ship on a certain time. And now you have all these people. Whoa. I believe that was a version of Bugzilla that we just saw. You've got to ship on a certain time, and now you... Yeah, that looks like Bugzilla to me. Old school Bugzilla. Old school Bugzilla. Bug 1555. I'm actually curious. Is that bug still around? Let's find out. I'm, I'm just going to just take a quick detour here. Bug 1555. Is it still around? Gecko Developer Preview. Yes, Gecko Developer Preview has programmatic or has prematurely time bombed itself. Has prematurely time bombed itself. Currently checking where where is that comment that this person currently We're watching this comment being written. This one right here from L E G E R, whoever that is. They're typing, typing this comment right now. Isn't that fascinating? That's wild. All right, let's keep going. You have all these people. You have the clock ticking. It gets pretty intense. Since Netscape began, the amount of code making up Mozilla has increased by a factor of 30. The job of programming and debugging it rests upon a precarious balance of science and art. What does it say right now? They uh, talk about what they do as if it was a kind of alchemy, a kind of wizardry. It does remind me of athletics in that way. You know, why is someone a good baseball hitter? Often the, the hitters themselves can't really explain it. And often the best software people cannot themselves understand why they're so good at it. I don't know. I feel like the mentality has changed since then. The idea of these sort of like gifted wonderkids who are just like, oh, they're they're so good at X, Y, and Z. They're so good at programming. They just you got to find those people. I think it's it's uh, the mentality has changed. I think of programming as closer to carpentry or woodworking, where you know, if you've got access to the tools. And if you have the time, it's something, it's it's a it's a skill you can pick up. And it's a handy skill to have woodworking. You can build your own furniture. You can fix furniture. You can fix things. You can modify things. You can connect things together. Um, but it's not like there are people who are just born to, you know, you are born to be a carpenter and you are not born to be a carpenter. It's just some people are interested in it, I guess. And, and some people might, have some some talent for solving puzzles and programming that you know they maybe they they're able to pick it up a little more easily a little more quickly but it plateaus you know there's a there's a threshold or a what's the the math term Asy asymptote asymptote so like it's not like someone who learns programming is learning linearly for their entire time that they're programming 
they hit usually in my experience anyways an asymptote there's a plateau and yeah they're learning every day but it's like just a little bit more just a little bit more and someone who maybe learned just a little bit maybe they started a couple years after maybe they didn't maybe they started in their 20s or in their 30s or in their 50s they can learn they at the beginning they learn linearly and then they also hit that that asymptote and they're pretty close to one another if you look at it in the graph so you know uh, the idea of a programmer being like a baseball player that you just kind of, you're, you're scouting around looking for, you know, someone who's just got the strong enough arms to do it. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I subscribe to that. All right. This code that we're looking at here, I, I recognize some of these size underscore T. That is something that I think C++ or just C gives us this, this sort of type. That's a portable type. Um, I'm not familiar with this S dimension 16. L pane, these are these are new, but the idea of an array iterator, um, that that seems familiar. This all just looks like C plus plus to me or C. I think what makes a great programmer is being raised techie. In my particular team at Netscape, I think we all grew up techie. We all grew up with with computers around us somewhere, so that we were exposed to them before we became adults, if any of us are really adults. Yeah, see, that's that's sort of the old school thinking, you know. You grew up with computers, and, and and you know, while that does give you an advantage, certainly it might give you an initial advantage. That's not a prerequisite to being a programmer, uh, a good programmer, an effective programmer. It's not a prerequisite. Jim's the most grown up of us, and certainly being a like uh, adult child is also not not a prerequisite. Um, yeah, there's some old school thinking here. A lot of my childhood from roughly age 6 to age 17 was around here. Life was just a nightmare. This is a very, very scary place. So two school wasn't too bad, uh, but it meant that get to work on puzzles and problems. All of the puzzling is math, and that puzzling is the exact same feeling, the exact same problem that you go through when you're programming. When I was young... Now that I agree with not the math so much yes there are certain degrees of math but it is a kind of a puzzle you know like that's what it feels like to me anyways it might feel different for other people but when i'm working on software problems it does feel like a puzzle of a kind uh, and whenever you figure something out and you find the solution it's a bit like the puzzle kind of unlocking i get the same sort of satisfaction from picking a lock or beating a, one of those physical puzzles or completing a jigsaw puzzle um, it's just very satisfying to, to suddenly see a through line to completion. I'm going to be building with Erector sets and Lego. Now, the structures that you build are in software. My mom is a first class geek too. And so I have a, the unique experience of being able to talk shop with my mom because she's a director of really important stuff at Sun. And Netscape, one of the code words for is the average person going to be able to use the software is, well, can my mom use it? That, still very old school. That is embarrassingly old school. It's like, well, yeah, my mom can use it. My mom can write optimizing compilers. By the time I was 12 years old, I was making 50 bucks an hour programming computers. People say, what should, what should I be? Should I, should I grow up to be, uh, you know, well, I say computer programmer. Yeah, if anything, uh, like I wouldn't, I hope anyone who's watching this with me, like don't look at this as inspiration for like, okay, this is what real programmers look like, like the golden era of like programming. This is what you should try and be is these people. That's not, that's not what this is about. I'm just, we're just looking at the environment of where Mozilla and Firefox came out of, uh, where it was originally born, warts and all, warts and all. The thing about that makes it a youth culture is one's capacity to throw one's entire life on the line with these firms. Entire life commitment, meaning 24, 7, 365 work commitment. Another old school thing. I definitely do not feel like now, like at least giving 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year for uh, a programming gig that is that is not 
healthy. And like maybe if it's a startup that you're doing, uh, they might demand that kind of hustle in order to survive, maybe. But I don't know. I, I fu- that's a great way of burning yourself out and hurting yourself. Is that it's I, it, this guy phrased it as commitment, but that to me is an imbalance, an imbalance of of uh, of your life. You need to have work life balance. And I think the industry has learned that um that work-life balance is kind of there's a more mature way of looking at software development throwing yourself into a thing where you don't know if that job is going to be around soon there's no stability here so it's very kind of a weird um, irony that the very people who are inventing the future can't see their own future this is a monk-like existence. There are very few women in these societies. These are male societies. They are secret societies. They function very much like the Masons or some... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Street gang. Evil. 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 What a, why am I an evil Did you have you ever seen a male saying, if you have a source 331 bug, you will be in here at 1.30? I thought it was 2.30. <laughs> now you're evil and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I'm actually just in a different time zone. I okay. thought stupidity was an excuse, though. A lot of people at Netscape don't get out much because they're at work all the time, but most people's social interaction, I would expect, is, is revolves around work just because... This is some day drinking? Hold on a second, what is this person drinking? A lot of people at Netscape don't get out much because they're at work. Yeah, that is that that's some that's some booze. Work all the time, but most people's social interaction I would expect is, is revolves around work just because so many people spend so much of their time at work. Hey Chris, it's Tara. Yeah, I mean, um, how much do you love me? Good. What do you know about like writing uh, stuff, applying in the JavaScript and Java and XFD? Whoa, what did what did she just say? Threading JavaScript? Here, I'm just gonna listen more closely here. Good. What do you know about like threading stuff applying in the JavaScript and Java and XFD? I didn't catch it. I didn't catch it, but JavaScript back then was definitely not multi threaded. They didn't have workers. It definitely ran on the main thread. And I don't know if there was any Java powering any of Netscape back then. I mean the uh, the HTML the XML parser is actually to this day I think it started as Java but then it goes through a conversion process to convert it to C I think that's how it works I think it's called Xpat I could be wrong about that something like that all we have left to hold on to really is the workplace I mean it is the modern village people get to know your history they shrug at your bad jokes there's a kind of familiarity that uh and continuity that we don't have elsewhere paul yeah. we're gonna go out in a while and get something to eat and uh do stupid things you interested sure sure right okay purpose of this meeting is not to beat up people uh the purpose of this meeting is to make sure that as a company we are incredibly focused on getting the bug count to zero uh we've been moderately focused up until now we need to be Deadly focused from here on in. Okay, uh, <laughs> Jeff Weinstein. Is he in this room? <coughs> he is not in this room. Did not check in this weekend. He, was was he did not check in this weekend. He did not answer his mail. And he hasn't answered his phone yet either. His locator shows he's with the rest of the colonists. <laughs> <laughs> the old saying is that trying to manage programmers is like trying to herd cats. You know, you, you want them to be cats. I mean, if you like cats, I mean, because you want what's unique about that creature, but they really don't all like to go in the same direction. Where the hell does Weinstein sit, actually? In less than four years, Netscape has grown from a handful of people to over 2,000, and sometimes locating a programmer becomes yet another obstacle for the browser team to overcome. Yeah, I guess back then, I mean, instant messaging, was that happening? You had uh, MSN, ICQ, I don't know if it had been part of the workspace yet, you know, doing instant messaging. Um... I mean, certainly things like Slack didn't exist. Uh, I mean, you had IRC maybe, but I don't know if they were using it. So I, I'm trying to think of how they would be trying to find this person. If it wasn't email, they might try phoning them. Um, but I don't know if you could like ping them on IRC or whatnot. Um, expat.
from the RL box blogs. Yeah, expat. I'm pretty sure that's the uh, that's the name of the XML parser library. I'd say he's not in there. That would be my guess, straight out. He's not there. Jeff Weinstein. Who? When's the last Whoa, time he was that's in a here? lot of Coca Cola. Hold up. Straight out. He's not there. Look at all that Coca Cola. This is not a sponsored video. This is not a sponsored Joy of Coding episode. Um, look at all that. And there's also a bunch of CDs. Wow. When's the last time he was in here? This afternoon. Okay. So, Tar and I are ready to take a hit out on him. Okay. Right, well, if you see him when he comes back, tell him to panic and run around. And, okay. and we're, like, doomed on Mac right now. Doomed! They, the person that's working on Mac is, like, waiting well, for data, right? You should go around and get, like, every behind. person in the company saying, Doom! Netscape's predicament has much to do with this man, Bill Gates, whose uh, company, Microsoft, has made him the richest and arguably the most powerful man in the world. All right, if we could have order, we'd like to begin. Viewing Netscape's browser as a potential threat to his computing empire, Gates has moved swiftly, making his own browser free, and Netscape claims also engaging in unfair business practices to take away its customers. I mean, the idea of an, a, a browser that you'd pay for is is kind of radical now. I don't know if anyone would actually pay money in a store to get a box with a disk inside for a web browser now, but I think that's actually how it used to work back in the day. You'd buy a box, and it would have Netscape in it. You'd install off of some disks, floppy disks, or maybe a CD. Um and yeah, this was this was the thing. The Internet Explorer was being bundled with Windows 95. I believe that was the first version where they started doing that. And uh, uh, you know, it that is sort of the crux. That was part of the the major thrust of Netscape's complaint here in the antitrust suit. But we need to explore today whether you and your company have crossed the line, or on the other hand whether this is just the carping of disgruntled rivals. Netscape CEO Jim Barksdale argues his company's case before the Senate. Hang on a second. I want to correct myself. It may not have been 95. It may have been 98. One of those two were the ones that started to introduce Internet Explorer. Maybe it was 98. I don't remember. And certainly nobody here on this panel is a greater admirer of Mr. Gates or his company than I am. But we do ask that Microsoft be held accountable for some of their actions, actions that intimidate, PC OEM manufacturers to use their products and exclusionary practices that prevent them from using my products. Not all companies succeed. Some fail to embrace change. This is the way technology in the free market works. The software industry's success has not been driven by government regulation, but by freedom and the basic human desire to learn, to innovate, and to excel. Man, the, to the talking points have not changed. The talking points have not changed at all. It's just there are different people saying them, but the talking points in the, the, the courtrooms have not changed. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, Netscape programmers continue working around the clock in a race to meet Mozilla's release date. These guys, they tend to work very consistently, so they'll just keep working until it's done. They won't stop. They don't need food. They don't need sleep. They don't need anything. <laughs> Yes, they need food. Yes, they need sleep. Or else they are what we like to call a bug factory. You know, there's a point. It's well studied and well understood at this point. There's a limit to how long you can work until you start actually becoming a liability. You know, you cross the eight-hour mark per day. You don't take a rest. You don't take a break. You're actually producing work that you need to f clean up in following days. You're actually creating more work for yourself. You know, um... This idea of just like working until it's done nonstop, kind of like what they do at, at, at hackathons. Like it's fine if you're trying to spin out a demo maybe, but production software, burning out on production software, like that kind of death march thing is is not the way you write good sustainable software. It's not how you keep programmers around these days anyways. It's okay that they take pay, but... You know, that's <laughs> A while ago, people from Harvard came and said, well, how do you develop software? We're writing a book. And I talked about all the things that I thought were really important. And they were just, it felt to me like they were shaking their heads going, no, gee, he doesn't know about principle seven. And no, oh, he doesn't know about principle 22. And in some ways, they're right. I really haven't got a clue, right? I really like to err on the side of every day we wake up in the morning and say, based on what I know today, what's the best way to get to, to where, where we all want to go? 
I personally, or me and you three of us, do not have time to read all two million lines of source code to see that there are no remaining problems. We're going over here, zeroing in on Jeff Weinstein. With March 31st only days away, the team can't proceed until Jeff Weinstein, an expert on some of Netscape's most arcane code, finds time to complete the bug fixes on his list. How are you doing? Okay. They found him. This is the, this is the Weinstein guy, and you can tell because of all the Coke cans. Um, all right, let's see what. Oh, he's got an O'Reilly book on his desk. I don't know what book it is, but I see the the animal shape. All right, well, you're officially the most. Deep. Oh, it says Pearl. It's a Pearl book. He's got a Pearl book on his desk. There used to be Pearl actually powering some of the build system of. Um, of Mozilla, of Firefox, actually. There was Perl, Perl scripts. These days, it's it's Python. We use Python. Individual in the company, and uh, You imagine these days walking around with a list of bugs on paper, and you walk up to someone's desk, and you hand them a list of bugs and say, I need you to fix these on this piece of paper? What a wild concept. <laughs> and this is not that, not that long ago. But it's just, it's, it's, it's a real snapshot in time. All of this is a real snapshot in time. This one I can close. Same with this one. Yeah, a bunch of these. Hopefully, I'll... I did see just now if close. we... Same with this one. This is a silicon graphics machine. It's one of those, um... I re this is one of the first non-Windows machines I ever encountered... Uh, I mean, I was familiar with the Macintosh, but I had a friend growing up whose whose dad, I believe, worked for SGI, and I believe he had one of these machines. And and it ran Netscape, as I remember. Yeah, a bunch of these. Hopefully, I'll get most of it done tonight. His goal, he was just going to stay all night, and he was going to get it all done. The good news is actually, I think by about, I'm not sure if it was 9 or 11 o'clock at night, he actually was completely done. Yeah, I mean, who reviewed those patches? Um, were they good patches? Does this does this person have a family? Does he have kids, a partner, um, you know, dependents, that sort of thing? This is, these are not laudable things these days. Staying until eleven. This is this is a. Back then, it may have been a badge of honor that you're spending so much time doing work. These days, in my book anyways, it is a sign of failure. It's a sign of planning failure, of process failure, if you're having to spend this much time fixing bugs, um, hunting people down. It, this is a process failure. It... Reaching a critical milestone is cause for celebration. <laughs> One bug left, and it's a really, really hard one. But I'm gonna make me kill you. Close before three thirty. Yeah. I will close it before three thirty. It'll be good. The bug count is small. There are some bugs that are not currently closed, but most of them are like piddly little annoying things that. Some nope. of it's stuck. Yeah. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Oh, the, uh, the mighty ones there's just been a tremendous pile of people working really hard this week to do the impossible. There's this magic phrase that Michael Toy invented, which is Zaro Boogs. Zaro Boogs. Zaro Boogs. We still have that. If you go to Bugzilla and you search for something, like, uh, let's search for something that's definitely not going to be in here, like Zaro, Zoro Boogs. Like, I'm just going to put in a, uh, a nonsense search term so that there's going to be, hopefully, no, no search results. This is what it says, Zaro Boogs found. It's still in Bugzilla. You'll still see it to this day. Um, which is there's this magic phrase that Michael Toy invented, which is Zaro Boogs. Um, which is, it's not quite perfect, but it's perfect enough. You know, zero bugs, Zaro Boogs. Do you have a spare monitor upstairs in the Cube, right? Uh, yes, I do have a spare monitor. This is the first big test. We'll announce... Woo! This is a... I remember these. It was like a CD in a case. So that you didn't have to, um, you know, take an actual CD with like the, the kind of 
fragile layer like reflective layer on the bottom because that can get smudged so what they do sometimes they'd have them in these housings which you could carry around and then you insert that housing into a drive that would accept it almost like a floppy disk you know it was like a cd inside of a floppy disk i remember those cider actually be able to make mozilla work if not netscape stands a good chance of missing its march 31st all right, what's going on here? This is a this looks like an SGI machine. Looking at the uh, the OS sort of the window decorations here. Uh oh, wow. What what the heck is this little uh, limerick there? What is going on? And uh, they're grabbing the I guess presumably this is the source code. It's a tar file that's got all the source code in it. And they're pulling it off of a pulling it off of the CD. First deadline. I thought this was going to be a huge thing. I thought it was going to be like 100, 200 people here, like all in rows, like with Soviet oh. style. Yeah. <laughs> Compiling. Well, we're nowhere near that organized. All right. Looks like it's all there. Here we go. Yeah. Wow. All good. It's pretty simple how stuff's built. It's just there's a set of scripts that are set up to say exactly what to compile, and then they all get lobbed together into Mozilla, hopefully. <laughs> Here it is. Yeah. Whoa, hold up, hold up, hold up. Look at what this Mozilla, shirt this guy's wearing. <laughs> that says Moxie Fruvis. Moxie Fruvis. Moxie Fruvis was a Canadian band. It was like a kind of a, a folk band in the 90s. Um, they're relatively local, too. Uh, uh I actually think one lives in my neighborhood. One of the members of the band might. I, I'm not entirely certain. Uh, but they uh, they had a number of hits in Canada. The idea that someone was wearing a Moxie Fruvis shirt in Silicon Valley is kind of wild. Um, the One of the members ended up being kind of embroiled in some, some pretty sketchy stuff in recent years uh, unrelated to the band. But the band was good. I enjoyed their music. Here it is. Yeah. If you get it to work, then it means anybody can get it to work. That's true. That wasn't... I don't know if that's a compliment. Like, it's kind of a backhanded compliment. If you can get this to work, it means anyone can get this to work. And maybe that's a good thing. I mean, it's not... It sounds like what they're doing here is they've built a machine. It was a clean machine. And they gave this person with the Moxie Fruvis shirt the, 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 the disc. And they said, okay, see if you can build Mozilla. See if you can build the source code. Um, so I understand what they're doing. It's like a sort of a clean room build um, to see if it can be done. So hopefully it works. Let's see. It worked, apparently. Mozilla Navigator, it said. Oh, that was pretty. Yeah, it's. No, I don't think it's working. Well, uh oh. Whoa. You crashed it. Help, shot the food. So it sounds like they got it built. One of the things that you learn in compiled languages, though, especially C, or say is just because something builds doesn't mean it works. Uh, it's, that building is just the first step. Does it execute properly is the is the next question. And it sounds like it built properly. It did not execute properly. These days, we have a language called Rust, the systems programming language, where if it builds, it's probably doing what you hoped. Um, at least it's not doing it dangerously. Probably. It's actually going really well. I didn't think we'd actually get somebody to build this quickly. We had to do one small adjustment. And it worked. With the source almost ready to ship, Netscape must explain the significance of Mozilla to the press. Basically, what we want to do is we want to give them a little bit of the history, and then we want to go into what's actually going to happen tomorrow. The other important takeaway then, too, from this is that this is a really exciting, cool thing. Good afternoon, Forrester. Hi, Stan Dolberg and uh, Eric Brown, please. Avery Choice Mail for Stan Dahlberg. I'll transfer you now. Good afternoon, Forrester. 
Hi, this is Maggie Young calling from Netscape, and I have a scheduled conference call with Stan Dolberg and Eric Brown, and I just got Stan's voicemail. Netscape hopes the press will greet Mozilla with the same enthusiasm it had for the company in its early days. At 11 a.m. this morning, Netscape stock went public and Wall Street went bonkers. <laughs> Initially offered at a price of $28 a share, Netscape shot up to 72 within minutes. The stock. Yeah, that was the that was the bubble, I think, in the in the mid 90s there is bid up at extraordinary levels in the first couple of really days and weeks of its introduction. It is the biggest initial public offering in basically Wall Street history. Good afternoon, Forrester. Hi, this is Josh Walker. Today, less than three years after its record-breaking IPO, however, Netscape's story generates a different response. Are you there? Um, as you know, tomorrow is March 31st. Yep. So that means um, source code will be made available to the developer community. And we thought we would just um, catch you up to speed and walk you through that and see if you had some questions. Either I'm brain dead or it takes a lot of effort to communicate. And so I'm concerned that while you all know what it means, I'm, I'm not confident that it's coming across to the press. Right, I think those are good points. By opening up the source code, we basically extend our developer community from those folks that are inside of Netscape to hundreds of thousands of developers outside of Netscape. Yep. So you, it's no longer Netscape versus Microsoft, it's Netscape and all of the Netscape you know, virtual community. I think there is a belief that Netscape doesn't have a position to continue to compete with Microsoft in the browser front. And that, well. in essence, you've given up Lol. This was a lot more smooth than I had originally anticipated. Really. Uh, I'm still waiting for the major bump in the road that's going to happen sometime between now and tomorrow afternoon. In software development, there's always a bump in the road. We just want to hear the Apple story. They just can't quite get themselves comfortable with the patent grant or with whatever we tried to do to fix it for them. What so the last thing back out of their lawyer was, gee, I don't know that we get enough protection. Mozilla has a small piece of code from Apple that has not been cleared for public license. There you go. That's what, like, that's that's the struggle. It's like they were having to find things that are patent or license encumbered that aren't allowed to be open sourced, and then they have to rewrite them. That's what all of this work is. Um, it's not like they had to build a new thing from scratch entirely they had to identify the things that they didn't have the ability to open source and rewrite those things some of which they didn't own you know some it sounds like apple had a patent on some part and it sounds like apple was not interested in having those uh patented pieces be open sourced okay we have to escalate hi this is mark andreessen um, i called a few minutes ago so my wife and uh, left a message um I w we're trying to get, the problem is I can't get phone, the, there's no one at the Apple switchboard, so I'm having a hard time getting phone numbers for people. Awesome. Hold on. Whoa, this looks like Steve Jobs' phone number. I don't know. I don't know if uh, they knew, like when this, when this documentary uh, was published, did they know that they were putting Steve Jobs' phone number on the whiteboard uh, in a documentary? Huh. Six two zero. In order to ship Mozilla the next morning, Scott Collins is called in to replace Apple's code with his own invention. And theoretically, we believe this is possible. It's my last bug. When I complete this bug, I will be allowed to rest. <laughs> Should have seen this coming. Crunch mode at the very end. It's not healthy. So I stayed up until about 5.40. Uh, this morning, writing this replacement class that made my life a living hell. I got it basically running. It's all running. It's all really good. And thank heavens, uh, we got permission from Apple to ship the regular short. It's my oh. <laughs> so this poor this poor guy had to rewrite this thing. Sp stayed up until five in the morning rewriting it, 
and then they got permission from Apple to open source it. That is understanding wild. that Jamie is going to be the person that it's going to be pushing the bits up to the website at around 10 o'clock. Is that correct? Okay. And we're going to be staging some different photo opportunities for the press at that time. There will be television cameras. So couldn't we just like, hire actors to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Here it is, big day. One way to learn to run a marathon is put a person out 26 miles into the desert and say, you know, that there's this bomb on your back that's going to go off in a certain length of time if you don't get into the town. Well, that'll motivate you to get in, but there's a certain chance that you'll be blown up. Yes. Uh, five to ten. <laughs> so. It's going to be late. Hurry up. And welcome, everybody, to the conference call. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today, uh, Netscape announced that the first developer release of its Communicator 5.0 source code is available for download from the Mo Mozilla.org website. And you know where Tara is. It's the second floor? Yeah, it's the first floor, um, Wait. Like way on the other side. Isn't this guy, James Winsky, isn't he supposed to be the one who's, like, uploaded the source? Has he done it yet? Because they're doing this press con. I don't. I know that the documentary might be trying to, like, increase the tension, and I don't know if these two things are happening simultaneously or did happen simultaneously in real life, but um, presumably the source code is available by the time they're doing this conference call. I hope it is. That'd be a kind of a cluster if, uh, if it wasn't. And then today, on the end of March, as we announced, we are pushing the code out to the web, as they say, and we're delighted to be part of it, and we're very excited to see what happens. The good news is the marathoner is now coming into town with that bomb on his back, and it looks like he's going to make it. This is the moment of truth. They don't have a theoretical framework to write software. They're just writing it. Oh, hey. Here we go. It's just like hitting the baseball. If their code gets a home run, nobody's asking questions. Well, this doesn't make sense, or why do you do that? Why does it work? Nobody cares why it works. <laughs> yeah, there's any reason. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. What's that? Um, well, it's not connected to the uh, the machine that, that controls the FTP push is like not answering. Is it loaded? It's, it's blast, uh, not uh, blast. Oh, so yeah, maybe. Yeah. Good reason not to. Uh, oh, that's it. Yeah. Duh. Duh. Okay. We're okay. Up. Yay! It's super. Max there. Phoenix is there. There's the source code. 11.7 megs for Macintosh. 8.8 .8 megs for Unix. Unix. Well, 11.9 megs for Windows. Wow. Well, and you also have to remember that the source code, when you downloaded it, it was the like just the snapshot of the source. Um, you weren't doing what we do nowadays, which was like a, a mercurial clone or you know a Git clone of the source code, which is gigabytes and gigabytes, because you get every revision effectively um, since the transition from CVS to to Mercurial. You get that whenever you use git clone or mercurial clone, whereas these, this is just a snapshot. So they're not really setting people up to do, um, you know, version control here. Uh, they didn't open up their version control to the world. They just said, here's a tarball of the source code if you want to build it. So, you know, the idea of opening up your source control to the world and the public was probably a, a step too far, a bridge too far. Um, but, uh, and yeah, Smurf D points out that downloading 11 mags from dial-up was probably several hours. Like, I grew up with a 28.8 dial-up modem, 28.8 kilobytes per second dial-up modem, and that's, that's like it going at max speed. And so if I were to try and download the Windows build of this whenever I was, a, right whenever this occurred, I'd probably need to do it overnight, and I'd be tying up the phone lines while I was doing it. This is there. We're done. We're done. We're done. It's up. We're done. <laughs> since, since Jamie is here, 
I'm told that means that we have now pushed the source out on the net. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, we decided not to. <laughs> Did he find it? It, it? it was just a stupid idea. <laughs> That's our story, and we're sticking to it. A little vaudeville act there. Oh, the, oh, look at those T-shirts. Those are like old school. It was it say that free the. I think it says free the source at the top. Uh, old school t-shirts, Mozilla.org. If you can find one of those, they're very rare. For a moment, maybe it's a free the lizard. Takes a breather. In the first, <laughs> I think it's gonna work out. Says a guy from Netscape. Well, uh, it kind of did. Not the way you're hoping. Not the way you're hoping. First hours of its release, the source code is downloaded thousands of times. But the number of downloads is no guarantee that Netscape will receive enough valuable contributions to help the company reverse its slide. Whoa! Let's back up for a second here. Okay, so this is a. I don't. I don't know what this is. This Sun OS. I'm not entirely certain. Or is this old old KDE? I don't know. Uh, but this is Communicator, Netscape Communicator, and it sounds like they're at Mozilla.org, old school website, and they're downloading the source. And to help the company reverse its slide. Here, uh, we've got a bunch of directories that I recognize: App Shell, App Runner. CVS, so this person has access to the, the source control, some kind of source control. XPFE is a directory that we still have. Um, that actually stood for like the cross-platform front end, I believe, um, which I think eventually became Zool, the Zool stuff. Is it old GNOME? It's old GNOME. Good call. So it's not, it wasn't KDE, it's uh, old GNOME. And I recognize the developer here. This is Stuart Parmenter, a.k.a. Pavlov. Um who was at Mozilla when I was here. When I joined up, he was here. He was working on a number of things, but he's recent. he left a number of years back. Uh, I think he was working, he's working in the health industry now, I think. He's known as Pavlov to me. He's Pavlov. And that's Brendan Ike. You may be familiar uh, with him. He is the founder of, um, you know, Brave Software, the Brave browser, but maybe more famously, he is the uh, originator of the JavaScript programming language. At pavlov.net on IRC, he's Pavlov or Pav or um, Pav sleeping or Pav tired up too late. And um, without him, I think we'd be you know months behind. I think uh, Ike also mentioned IRC there, so it sounds like they were already using IRC to communicate. Well, that's good. Netscape's notoriety draws code. This is he's going to destroy his back. By the way, like look at this. He's got the monitor on the floor. I don't know why they set things up this way like is it just for the shot or was this his actual workspace because this is this is gonna wreck his back and his neck um good writers from around the world willing to work on mozilla without pay one such contributor comes from rural georgia Ocris writes maybe they were moving in yeah it's possible right. oh <laughs> flying the old confederate flag <laughs> Yikes. I have been amazed over the last two or three years when, especially his mother would come tell me, well, so-and-so called from uh, maybe New York, or, and they were coming to Atlanta, and they wanted to talk to Stewart or see him, and they were going to go down and have lunch. Well, I'd say, you know, who is this person from New York? And, and then all of a sudden, well, he's been working with Stewart on uh, some programming issues for uh, a year or so, and he wanted to come down and meet. He said, well, did you tell him you're only uh, 16? <laughs> I, I had no idea. Um, and that's great. That's a, that's a wonderful thing because he's he's contributing. He's it doesn't matter that he's young. We're in the place we call the cave. We just shut. It. So it sounds like this is where he does most of his work. I like how he's kind of in the background, almost as like a piece of furniture, while uh, his I guess this is his mother is being interviewed. But even still, like this is terrible. Ergonomically speaking, this is going to destroy his upper back, his shoulders, his his traps, like. All all parts of me, uh, you know, especially if this was the time where everyone was working all of the time, uh, his posture is going to... Now, it's possible that this is maybe why the reason he transitioned into, into health technology um, is because of how just you know, his ergonomic setup here is just garbage. Uh, he needs to have his monitor up about here so it's with his eye line so his neck can be straight. 90 degrees, folks, that's the secret. 90 degrees, every... 
Everything needs to be 90 degrees. 90 degrees, if possible. The door, um, and this is where he does whatever he does. It is flabbergasting to think that your child has done something for this worldwide company um, instead of his homework. I went and looked back at the, old, the older code, and I, I was really frightened by how m incredibly messy and just awful the code looked. Brutal, brutal. Um, so yeah, it sounds like Pavlov, uh, Stuart Parment to download the code is like, this is messy and awful. It would have taken you, you, you know, years to try and figure out what it was doing. So we basically did it from scratch. Pretty much I'm providing the code that makes the browser show everything faster and uh, more efficiently than it used to. His keyboarding is... So what's he working on? XP viewer find dialog browser window i think at this point this is pre zool it looks like this is pre zool so they're writing the ui in c++ it looks like almost just like talking it's just um an expression uh he can express himself that way and it's it's just totally uh, unconscious almost um, just a part of how he communicates in the past Free code contributions helped build the internet. This is, I can't help but think how uncomfortable that must be for him to have like the, the camera just kind of like sweep in under his face while he's typing and just like act natural. Like in the past, free code contributions helped build the internet. How a commercial enterprise will benefit from free code remains a big question. Uh, it really had an impact. The TLDR, uh, free code had an impact, or open source, rather. Well, it's certainly my hope that the enormous amount of, of, of new people that no one company could afford to have working on any product uh, now contributing to the Netscape Navigator Communicator will make a significant difference in the improvement of the product. Uh, how that works against any competitor uh, remains to be seen. David Retterman, an analyst for a San Francisco investment bank, closely monitors Netscape's radical plan for investors eager to participate in the internet stock boom. The, the market is really kind of a voting machine. It's voting, yes, I believe that vision statement. Yes, I believe that's going to result in product sales. Yes, that's going to drive earnings up and, and you know, stocks should trade accordingly. The financial benefits to Netscape of giving away its source code are hard to measure. This is the 90s. We're in a room full of like stockbrokers. I would wager good money that there is a non-zero amount of cocaine within 25 meters of this cameraman. I understand why Netscape's trying to do it, but I think they still have to show me um, that um, behind the vision and the slideware, um, there's a real uh, sustainable business model that can deliver earnings. Um, and, uh, and so I'm in a show me mode for Netscape. Now my job will be three times as hard as it was yesterday. It was already 10 times harder than it needed to be. Right? <laughs> Did I just work really hard to ship the company jewels out of the building and it's just gonna just end us in this dying and yeah. rolling in poison and misery? The day after the stuff goes out, you really don't get a let up. There is then this sort of day in, day out, go to work, turn on the computer, code, code, code. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> Tara. Yeah, what's your doctor say, Tara? Uh, my doctor said, my uh, interestingly enough, that I work too much. <laughs> oh, does the doctor say you work too much? And then they're laughing. Hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and then if I went to work today after my appointment, he would personally kill me. I have a uh, an agreement with myself that by the time I'm 35, I'm either going to be a high school teacher or a bartender, but something, anything other than... Uh, yeah, position in the high-tech industry. Otherwise, I'll probably die by the time I'm 40. You know, now that I'm an old guy, I've kind of been around the block a couple times, and you can go from realizing this just never stops, does it? And that being really depressing. 
because you feel like I'm on, I'm on. I said I was never going to be on the treadmill, and here I am. I'm on the treadmill. I'm going to be running like this forever. Because they're good at software, they need to keep pace. And as a result, keeping pace means to shut a lot of other things out. They just don't have time to read, time to hear about the world. They don't have much time for their families. But when you're in a situation where you really have a lot of work to do and no time to do it, you know, you, you pick what you want. Some people pick wanting to have a family. Some people pick wanting to get some software done. Again, failure in planning. Failure in planning. I was born right after I started at Netscape. And uh, I basically missed the first two years of his life because of the intensity. I'd work till about 7 or 8 o'clock, come home, eat dinner, put the kids to bed, and then go back to work or work from home until 2 or 3 in the morning. And I was like the dad zombie. He would call and say, I'm on my way home, and then it would be two or three hours, and, you know, the romantic dinner candles had burned down. And... Oh, that is brutal. That is brutal. <laughs> I was thinking he was dead by the side of the road, so, you know, if 24 hours goes by and I don't hear from him, I pretty much know where to find him. I live in Michigan, and I commute. So it's quite a long commute. I don't make it every day. I only make it about every two weeks or so. Sorry, hold on. This fella is commuting from Michigan to the valley. That's a couple of hours of flight. Commute. Bah? But um, you know, there's quite a time change. Here it's something like 12.01 in the morning, and there it's 1954. <laughs> The motivation for moving back here is I wanted to get into a community, put roots down, and, and you know, feel settled. And uh, life is just different out there. It, it really is. I mean, here people like work at a car factory or whatever, and they're 30 years and out. If you want to go over there, sure, that's fine by me. We spent. Like 45 minutes talking about all his, like his whole story from job to job to job to job. And I thought it was pretty cool. He, he had like over, for, I mean, I don't know, it was like over like 10 or something jobs. He seemed to do it a lot during particularly peak uh, stressful times, like, you know, baby due in two months, I'm changing jobs now, dear. I like when everything's changing. That makes it exciting. That's why I do it. It's something to be in the storm, in the, in the, right in the middle of it and seeing everything new happening and putting it all together, it's really exciting. It's uh, almost addictive. I, I wouldn't want to leave it, that's for sure. At times, it's a clear sacrifice of elements of your personal life. Again, yeah, failure of planning. If you are having to sacrifice so much of your life, you know, seeing your kids, being there, what did she, what did she say? Uh, you know, I just had a kid two months after having your kid. I guess I'm going to change jobs because I want to get into the thick of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's what a wild time. What a wild perspective. Um, yeah. Uh, to me, you know, work-life balance is very important. And if you're doing that crunch, it's a failure in planning. You should have planned better. Plan better. I have to work very hard, but I have the chance of being rewarded for my efforts. The disadvantage, my life's moving on. I don't have any children yet. You realize there's a certain amount of my life that I'm sacrificing, and I'm going to look back. Yep. And a portion of this life is gone. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how many people on their deathbeds are like, I'm so glad I spent most of my life, you know, getting that software product out the door as, like, their final thoughts. I I'm, I'm, would wager few um you know work is you know, works good if you enjoy your work that's good that's even better um but work life balance to me that's like the tldr of of this documentary of like what not to do make sure that you got work life balance in the us we have at least several million people directly making a living from from software and it's the fastest growing group of people in the economy and it's certainly in aggregate the highest paying field of its size. I mean, yeah, you've got baseball, you've got Hollywood, but you know, when you really think of a group that has millions of people in it, these are the highest wages anybody's ever seen in the United States. Zillionaires. 
<laughs> the opportunity to, to win big uh, uh, for code writers is, is very real. In fact, uh, that, um, if you will, jackpot uh, opportunity is reflected here on a Wall Street trading desk. And I find that a lot of the uh, engineers and, and managers from Silicon Valley are very attuned to what goes on on these trading floors um, daily. By one account, 64 millionaires are created daily in Silicon Valley, where any technology worker can strike it rich overnight. I don't think that's changed. You know, I think Silicon Valley is still that place where, so, you know, there's a bunch of startups and people are still looking to strike it rich. Although it's it's possible it's losing some of its gloss. I think the cost of living um, and I, I don't know. I, I feel I've heard that there are it's not just the cost of living, but there are other things that are drawing people away from Silicon Valley and other places. Um, you know, Portland is a, a tech hub now. I think they're trying to make Austin and Texas one. And um, it would be lovely if if Detroit, I think, was able to find a second life as a tech hub. Because I know that they got, like, we kind of got a shot of Michigan. Someone was talking about, like, the auto industry. And they took a big hit. You know, not long after this documentary got made, uh, I don't know if it was after or before or during, but like Detroit kind of had the wind knocked out of it and uh, rebuilding itself as a tech hub might might be interesting. I don't know. I'm not a city planner. I don't know what I'm talking about. You join a company and they give you some stock options, which basically says rather than just giving you stock, they give you the right to buy the stock in the future at the current price. You might get stock uh in the order of you know maybe a, a year's salary or two years salary typically worth of options in some of these real booming companies uh out there on the internet the potential for becoming a millionaire or doing very well very very high the people who are very very early you know, they call them mozillionaires stock options are a con um it's 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 a carrot they dangle it's like oh well you know if you if you give up your one and only youth maybe someday you'll make money right uh, it's um I've known so many people who, who gambled on the startup lottery and got nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's just like a lottery ticket. It's a stupid tax. Um, I, I happened to win that particular lottery. <laughs> interesting. Uh, what an interesting character. From the day Microsoft announced its aggressive commitment to the Internet, however, Netscape's stock has been in a steady decline, and throughout most of 1998, Netscape options are essentially worthless. Brutal. A year and a half ago, half of our revenue came from browser sales. Today, none of it does. And well, any business person out there knows that that's a huge challenge. I mean, let me take your number one selling product away from you, and you replace that within a period of 12 months or so. Not many people want to do that. Even though the company sells other internet products, the marketplace views Netscape as a browser company in a losing battle with Microsoft. Yeah, Netscape made a number of other products, uh, you know, and it wasn't just a browser. The Netscape suite was also an email client. It was the, uh, you know, mail uh, mail reader and, and news reader, a composer for building websites, and an IRC chat built in. It was basically SeaMonkey. Um, that's, you can think of, if you download a copy of SeaMonkey, you get a, a clear sense of what the suite was. And um, I think Netscape also had like a server, a server product, but I don't remember what it was. Greg, this is John Barksdale with Netscape Communications. How are you? And it's clear that Netscape doesn't have enough pieces to threaten Microsoft. All right, Greg. Have I don't think that Netscape long term can survive as an independent company. Correct. <laughs> While Mozilla tries to recapture the early glory days of the company, integrating code from the outside means more work for everyone on the browser team. That is true, and that continues to be true. I mean, uh, there's a book, I don't remember what it's called. I think it's called The Mythical Man Month. Uh, and there's a law that's written in it. Uh, Mythical Man Month was the name of the book. And there's a law that's written in it. What's the law? Brooks's law. Brooks's law. Adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. 
although he, the the author calls that an outrageous simplifi- oversimplification but just because you've added a bunch of people to a project doesn't mean it's going to go any faster at least initially there's all that ramp up time and there's the communications overhead and then there's the integration work of integrating the work of all those people and you know the mistakes that get made that have to get corrected which are inevitable um yeah communications overhead um Adding more people to a highly divisible task decreases the overall task duration. However, other tasks include many specialties, uh, including many specialties in software projects are less divisible. Yeah, some tasks tasks are not uh, uh, divisible. Okay, let's keep going. What you told me, or I don't know what. Okay, this is bad. And we want to take the old free tree and use it as a subsection, and we want to build this interesting tree around it. No, that's not what we want to do. We have NS and NS3 at the top, right? It's either a project file for this or a project file for that. It can't be a project file for both. We don't have a plan for doing both. So right now, I have some files that have to come from here for Java in the single directory, and some files that have to come from here in the same directory, the same directory. Tell me how I do that. Brutal. That's the problem. The browser division, which costs the company almost $30 million a year to operate, and contributes few revenues to the company is reorganized in the fall for the second time in less than a year. Do we, know, do we have all the answers? No. We're going to try and learn what we can from seeing the people who've done this well. When I joined a startup, I knew that 19 out of 20 fail. When an employee comes to work at Netscape today, he doesn't have the perception that there's a 19 out of 20 chance that this job is not going to be in place one to five years from now. If you live here, it is the ubiquitous conversation. Do you believe that Microsoft has used either a illegal or just unfair methods to take market share from Netscape? And if the heart and soul of this industry is opportunity, yes, is did. egalitarianism, Microsoft having achieved its market share on anything other than the backs of its code um, really riles everybody up. The Justice Department has charged Microsoft with engaging in anti-competitive and exclusionary practices designed to maintain its monopoly in personal computer operating systems and attempting to extend that monopoly to internet browser software. Regardless of its case against Microsoft, Netscape has become a victim of its increasing size and the growing complexities of its code. The company struggles to maintain the vitality it enjoyed as a startup. When a company gets to be above a certain size, Whoa. it's just a process. Hold on. It's, it's, uh... what, what are we looking at here? This might be a user study. We've got, hang on, let's back up for a second here. We've got... Ah, sorry, I got the wrong Case button highlighted. Microsoft. Netscape has become a victim of its increasing size and increasing the growing size. complexities blah, 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 blah. of its code. Okay, you've got a person in here that has i guess oh, where are these coasters i don't know but like they're in front of a computer this is a one-way mirror right here the company struggles to maintain the vitality it enjoyed as a startup don't click on anything, don't click on anything. i heard i think they're getting some instructions uh via audio there's a camera you can see in the um in the mirror on the opposite wall that's filming this person uh, and this is i guess how they were using you know human participants for research company gets to be above a certain size it's just a process it's it's a, a mechanism for making money and innovation is like one possible way of doing that but it's a risky way so company big companies don't do that um, Microsoft actually doesn't do very much they buy companies they wait until someone has done something interesting and then they acquire them and then they milk it for all it's worth and I mean I don't mean to pick on Microsoft because lots of companies do that it's just a normal way of doing business sometimes they pick up a browser engine <laughs> Not just a company, but they'll pick up a browser engine or a whole browser. Sorry, what was that title card? Tired Corpse? Yikes. I guess that's what you get if you're working for 24 hours we're a day. We're on our way over to the Flint Center now. Now we're going to have an all hands meeting. Jim Barksdale has moved up the all hands meeting by roughly about a week we've just announced quarterly results and now this major change in direction well in case you haven't read the newspapers <laughs> uh, we have uh, as of 1.30 this morning 
uh, concluded uh, negotiations and agreed to sell our company to AOL of Dulles, uh, Virginia. Whoa! So that's the point at which they announced the sale of Netscape to AOL. Internally, they internally announced it, and I guess at the same time they, they, I mean, that fellow, uh, I think his name is Barksdale, said, if you hadn't read the paper, so it's possible that people learned about this in the newspaper and then went to work and heard about it. <laughs> Imagine. I can't imagine that day when they announced the merger, that they weren't like, oh, I don't believe this, you know, sort of what, sort of a nightmare scenario. Although, you know, the worst one would have been Microsoft's buying us, I guess, <laughs> you know. Kara Swisher is still a fixture in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, in like the news uh, as a sort of a probably one of the most, if not the most uh, well-known tech journalists still operating. And um, I respect her a great deal. I, I, was, I read a lot of what she writes and uh, you should follow her on Twitter if you can find her. She's also got a podcast I've been listening to called, I think it's called, what was it called? I was just listening to it yesterday because they were interviewing Neil Stevenson, one of my favorite authors. What was the show called? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is important. This is important. What's it called? I want to plug what she... Sway. It's called Sway. You should check it out. Then they would have, you know, you'd have seen like this, this flow of cars out of Netscape. Six months ago, they were insulting AOL's technology, you know, it was a service for idiots. Congratulations, Skippy. You've got mail. Uh, Andrew016 asks, are there people at Mozilla who have worked there since Netscape? Yes, there are still people here from these days. Uh, we mentioned one earlier, Dan Vedditz. Obviously, Mitchell Baker. Um, I think there are a few more. There's not many, but there's they're out there. Netscape was not unusual in the way they felt about AOL in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's very clear that nobody had any respect for the company. One of them at the Netscape called uh, Steve Case a soap salesman because he used to work at Procter & Gamble. The soap salesman bought them. The quote that came Ouch. out of this article was uh, Netscape, uh, something along the lines of, lived fast, died young, and left a tired corpse. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that I agree with that. I don't know. I think I would. I think I would. They, um, you know, bad planning. Bad planning. I don't and circumstance. Like, externalities you couldn't control. That competition, that's sort of the unfair moves from Microsoft. But also, you know, you really, you really ran your people ragged. I think Netscape's done yet. They bought us because they like us. They like what we do. And they don't want to disturb that formula. Oh, so really? So the plan is to not damage us in any way. There had been a lot of uh, a lot of speculation out on the net, you know, in the free software community, like, oh, well, this is it, you know, it's all over now. AOL is just going to screw everything up. So I wrote this thing that I put on the Mozilla.org site that laid out the worst case scenario, like, well, okay, even if everything goes wrong, it's still not as bad as you're saying it is, because the the nature of what Netscape did meant that the code belongs to the community now. A few days later, I got email from Steve Case saying, we think what you're doing is a great thing, and it's part of the reason we bought the company, and we plan to keep it going that way. So um, as far as Mozilla.org and Netscape and AOL's contribution to the open source movement goes, he says it's going to continue. The merger with AOL creates a windfall for shareholders that will give Netscape employees the chance to cash out and move on, causing speculation in the national media about AOL's ability to retain Netscape's key people. And already I hear, you know, AOL people come into Netscape and say, you know, this is the AOL way. Well, it's not going to work at Netscape. It's got to be the Netscape way with help from it. Uh, I just realized that I think that's Steve Jobs on the right here. Steve Jobs on the right. And we know because of uh, Andreessen was trying to call Steve Jobs at Apple that, yeah, Steve Jobs was back at Apple at this point. Way. Well, it's not going to work at Netscape. It's got to be the Netscape way. Is this a bridge? A Golden Gate bridge made out of Coke, Coke cans? Like pop cans? That's wild. With help from AOL. I suspect some of them will leave. You know, they don't want to be part of AOL. Some people just like the startup mentality. 
and those that want to uh, sort of be part of a juggernaut are going to stay and be part of the juggernaut. I wouldn't have called Netscape a startup. 2,000 people? Come on. I've been at Netscape for three and a half years, and it feels like forever. Um, AOL's focus and Netscape's growing focus has been marketing and advertising and all that stuff, and that's not nearly as interesting to someone who's sort of a techno fetishist. Uh, you know, I'm switching jobs, I'm selling my house, I'm moving, switching towns. Uh, Good for her. That's life for, for, uh, for startup land. I'm still young and stupid, as I like to put it, so I can get away with doing stuff like that. Year and a half ago. I recognize this fellow. This fellow was at uh, Mozilla when I joined up. He left since then. I think his name was Hoffman. Um, but he was here whenever I joined up. So Tara comes to me. She says, I want to be a manager so bad that I can taste it. <laughs> so we finally said, all right, you get to be a manager. And like within a week, she said, why did you ever let me do this? <laughs> And Tara's turned out to be like one of the Netscape's greatest managers. So here's the Tara, the release team manager. Tara leaves Netscape for an e-commerce startup, missing out on a big jump. Oh, sorry. I thought she left. I thought she said she was changing like careers out of software development. I was going to be happy for her because it seemed like she was burning herself out. But she's just going to go work for an e-commerce um, startup. And I hope she did well. And the value of her stock options in hopes of a bigger payout at her new company. Free Mozilla! Free yes, the source! Mozilla! Free the source! <laughs> Regardless of how AOL runs the Netscape business, it's not Netscape anymore. That part's over. And, you know, that's really sad. I, I wish Netscape could have gone it on their own. Frustrated by what he perceives as a lack of commitment to open source development, Jamie quits Netscape one year to the day he helped give away Mozilla. The movie Hackers, I think, is just a great movie. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I and, and there it is. You know, I was wondering whether or not that aesthetic, the echo of the Hackers movie aesthetic in what Jamie Zawinski was wearing was intentional or not, or just a sign of the times, but he just directly referenced the movie. If you're not sure... The, about the movie he's referencing is a famous, famously uh, kind of anachronistic, cringy, uh, I don't know, campy. It's a campy, like, techno thriller from this era, you know, of what they thought the hackers and the internet and computers were all like. It's almost, uh, it's almost, it's, I don't know if it was designed to be a comedy, but you can think, it, it, you watch it now and you can kind of get a, a flavor of what world you were in um, back then. I wish our lives were like that. I wish we were roller skating around in spandex and, and fighting bad guys, but... You're right. Roller, roller skating or roller blading in spandex. That's right. That's what they did in that movie. You know, it's, it, it's not. It's, it's sitting in a room and typing all day. This was what I was trying to escape. This, this life. I knew I did not want to live here. I've been out here now about four or five years. This is a nice place. This is Escape from the Jungle. I apologize we're going long, by the way, but I'm going to watch this to completion. Jim Roskind is promoted to Netscape's highest engineering rank. Last night I was here at four in the morning, and this isn't even in the middle of a critical push, but it's almost like an addiction, an adrenaline rush, a going for perfection, a pushing. And then, as you see the results... You see that pipe screensaver in the back? That's a blast from the past. You get the feedback to push harder. You know, I, I really shouldn't comment on this since I'm just as foolish as everyone else, but I'll just go ahead and do it while admitting that I'm foolish. There's just a tremendous quest for material wealth here. It's like the gold rush all over again. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the, the playhouse. And then this will be like a front porch with maybe little flowers and stuff. So it'll be like a cute little house. I went to Netscape because its main purpose was to generate cash based on this, this internet thing. That's like, what we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna get rich. It just took a heavy toll on our marriage and if it wasn't for God's grace, we wouldn't have made it. Why did I use God's gifts? Michael burned out. Michael came to a place where he, yep. where in his own life, where he said the cost is too great, I'm not gonna do it anymore. 
if people would look at this and say, oh, hey, this, this is a cool thing, I'm going to start a startup and get rich quick, you know, I just have to say, you need to count the cost. Because you can't exactly. retrieve the time that's lost. Exactly. Michael Tor, right. Netscape employee number six, achieved his goal of financial independence. He's a bass player. Check out that bass, five strings. And retired from Netscape shortly after Mozilla's release. In the Valley, if you've stayed someplace longer than about three years, people wonder what's going on. Why can't you get another job? What's wrong with you? Uh, if you're a programmer, you pretty much change jobs about every two years or so. That's still the case. I think it's a little longer now. I think it's, it's like the average is four years. Um, and Mozilla, Mozilla is different, actually. Uh, a lot of people here, they they have longer tenures. I've been at Mozilla or hacking on... I've been paid to work on Mozilla code for 10 years. Just a little over 10 years now. It's like ants, worker ants. They send a group out to do something. As that group approaches the task that they're going to do, some ants leave, more ants come on. Uh, by the time it gets to the target, it could be a totally different set of ants. I think as we distribute the set of work that we're doing and more and more in the information age, it'll be more like that. Scott Collins continues to commute to Netscape from Michigan. Wild. Ooh, point and click adventure There's a lot of pressure right now to complete our product on time. Uh, sort of weighed in with the ridiculous acrobatics the stock is doing. We were a $20 company. At, as of this moment, our stock is like $172. So it's hard to be depressed about the amount of work you have to do when every other cube holds a millionaire. When the deal with AOL closes in the spring of 1999, the value of Netscape's stock more than doubles since the merger's announcement. Netscape married right. Uh, they, like good for them, I guess. Their fortunes to AOL when the transaction was announced, uh, the implied valuation was about 4.2 billion. When the transaction was completed, the transaction was valued at 10 billion. So in effect, about five and a half or six billion dollars of net worth was created. So I think it was the very clever deal making of Netscape management that kept them in the game uh, much longer and Netscape shareholders benefited quite considerably. <laughs> Someone asks, will you work for Google Chrome if an offer comes in or is it against your value or ethics? I don't think I'd ever work for Google. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever work for Google. While many executives sold their stock during Netscape's final year, Barksdale bought more. And after the merger, he swapped his shares for more than a half a billion dollars of AOL stock. So he did all right. Another young man comes west to seek his fortune on technology's new frontier. I was a little bit nervous going into uh, this interview because um, I'm not entirely sure what to expect. It's a long way away, 3,000 miles. Uh, long way for your child to be, but uh, this is a place where there's a lot going on that, that he's very interested in and I think has some talent in this area. And uh, I really think that may, this may be a kind of home for him uh, as far as being able to work with people that uh, he can actually talk to. Hey. See you again. Let's see you. What I want to know is what you want to do. I mean, what your goals are. I believe it's like this is a little strange. We have a camera in a job interview. Like, presumably, he already had the gig <laughs> and they staged this, but it's a bit strange, especially because I think he's 16. That they have a camera crew, a documentary crew, sitting in on this job interview after he just drew drove from Georgia. So I'm pretty sure he's getting the job. But just I want to call out how strange that is. In the next couple of years, my my goal right now is I want to see the Unix version faster than the Windows version. Once we pull that off, then you know we'll see. But that that's my goal. Okay, cool. Pavlov is hired by Netscape. He postpones going to college. Hey, Taking part in what one investor has called the largest legal creation of wealth in the history of the planet, David Retterman moves to a new investment bank. 
Here's the data center. A uh, lot of lot of cable, a lot of fiber. These can be sort of, you know, internet connections. They can be our trading lines, our phone lines. Uh, you know, we're laying the infrastructure to basically uh, build a, a major merchant bank. Our view is that the internet changes everything, and we're going to uh, finance the companies that want to be the agents of that change. Look at this intersection. We've got we've got a bank here. In two years, you know, this may not be here. Why not? Why not bank online? Yeah. Gap's website is is one of the most successful commerce websites on the market. The Gap. I don't even know why Gap's renovating this store. Why aren't they investing more in their website? Well, I mean, I don't know what this whoa, you see that Yahoo sign? That was a famous sign. I don't know if it's still there in the valley, but there was like the sort of kind of um, uh, glitzy, campy, almost like Las Vegas style sign, the purple Yahoo sign. Because Yahoo is still a juggernaut at this point. Yahoo is a, I think Yahoo is a juggernaut at this point. Intersection may look like two years from now. When I started, people didn't know what HTML was, what the World Wide Web was, and all of a sudden, the power of the internet that had been there for years was available to everybody in an easy mm. way, point and click, the, the universal mm. language. It's like uh, Fantasia when Mickey is standing over the, the... Available for everyone, she said. That's important. That's important. Not just for the geeks. You want to make it available for everyone. Book that's open on the mountain, and he's looking in to see what to do, and he does something. He doesn't really know what he does. But it makes something happen. And of course, that thing gets out of control and keeps going. You don't know why it works. You don't know how it works. You just push a button, and it works. We're at the beginning of an industry, and, and who knows where that industry is going to go. This could all turn into television again. And it, yeah, it might. And it still might. It still might. You know, YouTube, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, they recently have been trying to, like, secure some deal with Disney on, for their paid YouTube and, like, they might have to lose all their Disney con uh, yeah, content. In a way, you know, the 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 fear is that the internet could become a lot like television. Net neutrality is a is a hedge against that to make it harder to prioritize certain sites and like purchase packages so that you can access Facebook, you can access blah, you can access YouTube or this is the Netflix package, etc. It could be controlled by a small number of 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 uh companies who, who decide what we see in here and that has also happened i mean uh m there are, there's a significant portion of the users of the internet i believe who think that facebook is the internet um and that that google is the internet and that's that is we have work to do and there's a lot of precedent for that i'm just laying down the tracks and there are these trains zooming by me and there's no way I'd want to say that it's a bad thing to have these trains fly by. It would be a horrible legacy. It ended up, ended up being the legacy of, of, you know, Netscape and the Internet. I, uh, I think, you know, that we could all, like, do what we're doing on, only under much more intense pressure and much faster. I'm not sure what he said there. Everything has to change faster, obviously. You know, look at Netscape. It was born and died. I don't want to use the word died, they wouldn't like that word, but it basically was born and overtaken within uh, four years. That's pretty fast, I think, because <laughs> they must think it's very fast. Near the end of 1999, the public still awaits Netscape's first open source browser, more than a year after Mozilla was released. The judge in the Justice Department's antitrust trial rules that Microsoft is a monopoly that stifles innovation. AOL begins the millennium with a new, even larger acquisition, and investors continue buying technology stocks, which trade with increasing volatility. Still, as the internet finds its way into every corner of daily life, so too will legions of programmers and their code, working fast and late into the night. That's Code Rush, we did it. We got to the end. Thank you, David Winton and these people. Thank you, everyone who worked on that documentary and for making it uh, Creative Commons licensed so that uh, we could watch it together. Okay, so that was Code Rush, everybody. Hope that was interesting. If you ever, you know, I, I talked throughout, and if that was annoying, you want to watch it on your own, the link to the full video 
you can watch is is in the uh, in the agenda. You can watch it on your own time. Okay, I want to spend some time. I, I know we're going way over time here, but it's a special holiday episode. I want to some, spend a little bit of time playing this game that I wrote right around the time that Code Rush was coming out. Someone asked, it's Creative Commons licensed? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. I hope it is because uh, I don't want the lawyers to come at me. But uh, let's see here. Uh, Creative Commons uh, 3. Yeah, this one. This this license. Um, yeah, it's in the Creative Commons. Heavily annotated copy of Code Rush. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. It's in the uh, Creative Commons. So that's good. Uh, so this game I wrote, uh, so I was one of those, uh, lucky kids who grew up with a computer and time after school to, um, tinker with it. And my uncle actually was the one who got me interested in programming. He got me a book on it. He helped me write my first couple programs. Um, you know, I was learning basic at the time and I wanted to make games at the time. And I had made a sort of a, an ASCII game called lost by myself it was really janky i doubt you could find a copy of it anywhere because i remember we posted it the q basic community had a lot of like these little sites that would host games some of those sites are still actually out there uh, the one that i remember is called pete's qb site and i think it's still here it's not with ssl though yeah sites like this so it's really like of a time of a time and like this style that we're looking at is from like the latter half of uh uh of the stylistic sort of like this was a fancy web design back whenever i was i was doing this stuff and uh the game that i'm about to show you is the one i found i found a copy of both the source code and the executable and I ported it using Emscripten, uh, basically just ha I'm running it inside of DOSBox because it's a DOS game. Um, and let's let's play it. Now I have to keep uh, forewarn you. This is going to be really cringy, really cringy, because I wrote this when I was young. I was uh, I wrote it with some friends when I was uh, like early teens. Uh, let's see. Let let me read the preamble here. This is a game I made with some friends back in 1999. It's pretty brutal. The graphics blow. The story and dialogue are nonsensical. The interface is really rough, but I recall it being a labor of love. We called ourselves Groovy Concepts Limited. We thought we were the coolest. My screen name was The Specialist, often just shortened to TS. I'm cringing so hard right now. Yeah, that's how I in IRC, in the QBasic, like in the forums and in the uh, IRC chat rooms, that was my screen name. The game was written in QBasic. I used the QBasic 4.5 compiler. For better or worse, I've used Emscripten and EM DOSBox to port them to the web. They are otherwise unchanged. I also eventually found the source code for it in a pile of floppies at my parents' place. The code is horrendous, but I find it interesting to see where I come from. It'll probably do a review of the code in my blog in the coming weeks. I never did. And then I'll link to it from here. The executable shipped with two pieces of text, a help.txt and a walkthrough. T-H-R-U dot text. That's being cool. I don't remember exactly why we shipped a walkthrough with the game, but maybe it's because we thought that'd be the only way to play it through to the end since the po puzzle logic makes Tommy Wiseau look like Mr. Spock. I've appended the text from both files to this document, warts and all. On behalf of the group of preteens pre who made this game enjoy. So that's it. Uh, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's play this game. Um, oh yeah, let's do it. So remember, this is the second game... <laughs> And we called ourselves Groovy Concepts. The first game, we had a different... We called ourselves Epsilon Entertainment, but they were like re-rebranded for the second game. We were just preteens. I I made the, the load screen kind of remind me of Doom. Yeah, this was our logo that we made. And I was like, whoa, lost one? Nope. Here's a stick of dynamite. You're playing Lost 2 by Groovy Concepts in 1999. All right, so what is this game? So from what I recall, there's not a whole lot of plot or story. You are a person named Gurfy Flirtmunder living in this, like, weird ASCII world. Um, and you can walk around just using the cursors. And I think we based some of the colors and the feel of it on Zelda. So we're fans of Zelda. 
that redraw performance is garbage uh, but you know you do what you can so yeah that that's a screen oh there's like a little river here there's you know collision detection I can't I can't uh, you know go through the water I have to walk across the bridge so that's uh there you go what do we have here now I remember being very proud of like this very simple AI I had written <laughs> to randomly walk this other character around now we're about to get some garbage dialogue. Are you ready? The way you talk to this person, you just walk into them, I think. Or do you just walk into them? Or do you press T? There you go, T. Bill Baxter, Desert Dweller. Hey, what's up? I say as Gurfy Flirtmunder. Um, I think I actually have to... How do I do this? I might have to full screen this in order to get the mouse. Yeah, okay. Okay. So I actually had the mouse working. There were ways you could do that in QBasic. And so... What are you doing out here? I'm trying to get a tan, says Bill Baxter. Where am I? This is the Vanderin Island. See, I'm doing world building. Do you know the Ancient? The Ancient was a character in the first game. And I, don't I think they were very important. I don't remember. Oh, the old guy? Yeah, I saw the Enforcer dragging him westward. So the Enforcer was like the villain of the story. I mean, that's about as, as deep as the story gets. There's the Ancient and the Enforcer. And the Enforcer is who, like... Um, uh, you know, that's the antagonist. So that's Bill Baxter. Thanks, Bill Baxter. Great dialogue. Uh, someone says true, uh, Smurfy says true LucasArts games. Yeah, like I was inspired by Zelda and like point and click adventure games. That's why I wanted to make games, point and click adventure games. So I'm just walking around. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, what's out here. I actually... I think I recall that there's like, yeah, there's someone here. T for talk. Flippy Gipper, a desert salesman. Howdy, friend. I sell ice. What's new? Nothing. It's all the same. <laughs> I, I was uh, uh, I was a nihilist even as a preteen. Um, can I buy some ice? It'll cost you $600 million. That's ice inflation. I don't think so, I say. How do I get out of here? If I knew, would I be out here? More brilliant dialogue. All right, let's get out of here. We don't have uh, any money to give Flippy Gipper the ice salesman. I think I remember how this goes, though. So we go here. We uh, How do we pick this up? Uh, take? T for take? You can't talk to that. G for get? Is it G for get? You picked up a bottle. So G for get to pick up a bottle. And if I remember correctly, there's an inventory system. If you press I, it brings up this like text-based inventory system. So I can do something. I can choose the bottle by pressing one, I think. One, yeah. And I can like look at it. It's a green bottle. There is something inside. Okay, uh, I'm going to, again, you can see the inspiration from like the LucasArts combine, separate, use, uh, D, I guess, is to look at a different item. That's pretty clumsy, but we're going to open this bottle. Hey, there's a magnet inside. Okay, let's take a look at the magnet. D, two, look at the magnet. Examine. It's a rather large magnet. Okay, great. So we're going to escape to leave the menu. Oh, nope. Uh, that was... <gasps> Am I going to be able to leave this menu? Yes, okay. I had just have to leave full screen first. Um... And apparently, uh, if you're in Canada, I just got a message there. Boosters for uh, various vaccines will be available soon for 18 plus in Ontario. So that's exciting. Okay, so we've got a magnet in a bottle. And I remember that there is a thing where I, I think, oh, here's someone else. Who's this? Mystic Healer. What more can I say? I'm a Mystic Healer. Howdy. Can you heal me? Sure, it'll cost you ten dollars though. I don't think I'm he. I, I need healing. There's, if I recall correctly, there was like a, a battle system. That's why there's so much like open desert. There's like a randomized battle system, but I'm pretty sure it's disabled by default. You had to turn it on with like a, a bit flag inside of a text file. Um, but I didn't like the idea of combat when I was a kid. But my friends did, so I think they were more Zelda people, and I was more a point and click adventure game. So I made it so you could turn it off. And so you don't need healing. How do I get out of here? Why do you want to leave? Is the game that bad? Oh, 
Uh, how come healing costs so much? I'm putting my kids through college. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. What do we have here? Um, if I remember correctly, we need to find... There's a crashed airplane out here. That's what I remember about this game. Is we'd in, written in a crashed airplane. Here's another person. Who's this? Can't talk to that. Here. Mystic Healer. Oh, it's another Mystic Healer. Bye. Bye. Okay. There's a bridge. And I think, yeah, I actually, the muscle memory, because I think I played this game a lot to, like, test it. We, we only had ourselves to test. Oh, there's another item with the question mark. G, forget. Uh, you picked up a rag. Okay, and I remember what you're supposed to do with the rag. So we've got, like, this crashed airplane in the desert. So you walk inside the crashed airplane. And you go up to this person. It's Pete the Pyro, local arsonist. Hey, buddy, got any matches? Uh, that's, I guess, what they're saying. Why do you play with fire? Because I like watching stuff go boom, says Pete the Pyro. What are you doing? Again, brilliant dialogue. I'm trying to get the cigarette lighter to work. So this person is a cigarette lighter. Uh, why are you in this airplane? For the shade, man. It's hot out here. And then you say, see ya. And he goes, okay. If I recall correctly, what we need to do is um, build Pete the Pyro a Molotov cocktail. So if you put a bottle and you combine it with the rag, combine with a rag... Oh, no, it doesn't work. Do you... Okay, uh, forget it. I want to... Can I combine the rag... Hang on a second. The, uh... Can I choose... You can't choose the rag! I can't... I can't choose the rag. That's wild. Is that a bug? I guess that's a bug in my game! But you need to somehow get the rag to be soaked in gasoline, I guess. And then you put it in the bottle. Maybe it's this guy. Here, let's go full screen again. Who's this? Salesman Bob, store owner. What can I help you? Uh, okay. I'd like to buy something. Sure. See anything you like? Oh, it, so it turns out we've got money. We can buy gasoline and dynamite and a souvenir mug. Conveniently, all of these things are purchasable and then we have no money. So let's purchase all of it. We buy some gasoline. Yes. Nice doing business with you. And uh, let's buy... Oh, I guess we can buy multiple gasolines. Let's not do that. Let's buy the dynamite. I know that we need that. Nice doing business with you. And I think we need the souvenir mug. Are you sure? Nice doing business with you. Someone says it must have taken you a long time to write this. Definitely. I think this was over multiple years. <laughs> of after-school labor with my friends. Uh, catch you later. I guess, uh, why do you keep wringing your hands? Oh, they're dirty, and this stupid rag is too greasy to clean them. I remember now. We have to give um, Storm and Bob. He's got a greasy rag. We're going to give him the clean rag. Um, and he gives us the greasy rag. So that's that's what we do. So you go in the inventory here. We've got this, gra this rag that I can't actually select how do we gas dynamite the mug how do we how come it won't let me choose the rag we have to give the rag okay g for give you can't pick that up hang on let's read the <laughs> maybe it's good i put in the walkthrough controls What's the, what are the controls? Using an item. If you have an item that you think you should be using on the screen, select in your inventory and choose use. And there's a cutscene. Combining. Ch opening. Choose the option to open the item. Sometimes the option is called gray, indicating the item can't be opened. Go west. Pick up the bottle. Open the bottle. Go back to the bottle. Choose up. Reach the healer. Go right. Keep going right until you find three path options. Choose up. Pick up the rag. Choose, use the rag. Go east. Use the rag. So you should be able to use the rag here, but I think there is a bug in the game. I can't use the rag. Three. Numlock? Do I... How do I... Three. Use the... 
I can type two. I can't type three. And I can't type six either, which is interesting. Why can't I use six? Or five. What's what's unique? I can do four. Four. I can do one, two, and four. What's unique about those numbers? So anyways, uh, I think we might be stuck. We might be stuck. Here, let's leave and re-enter. Inventory. Can I... Can I do anything with a mouse? No. I guess we could look at the source code. Do you have to be in a particular place to use the rag? Maybe. Maybe I have to be standing here. Inventory. Rag. Three. Rag. Rag. All right. Let's quickly take a look at the source. So I can... <laughs> I'm pretty sure the source is like, it's just one giant file. It's really poorly written, no indentation. Um, so rag, rag, get the item, rag, 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 rag. If item is rag, you picked up a rag. If inventory value select is rag, then put rag. If inventory of the value selected is rag, Invenum. So we've got an array, I guess, and we are val. If I remember correctly, this is how we like. We are looping through our inventory number, and we select. We check to see whether or not the selected item matches. <laughs> we can like turn it into a number. Val of select is a. Then select inven option. And then presumably you can select the rag. And I've got like these ops, op, uh, open, examine, use, use with. And I just use those flags to say whether or not you could do those things. And for some reason, invent select is not working. Sub inventory, print the invent box, update invent, do select in key. If select is not equal to nothing, then invent select select. So either the inventory array is wrong. <sighs> update invent, what does that do? Of Go through invent num and then you print it out. Three, three, I'm pressing three. Um, well, I'm sorry folks, that might be it. You, that might be it. Oh, uh, you can't use the first item and combine it with the rag? Maybe, I, I don't think so. Combine, combine with three, that doesn't work. Oh, it recognized three just now. So maybe that's the idea, D. Uh, rag. I can't select it, but maybe I can combine it. Combine the gas. Combine it with the rag. That doesn't work. Can I combine the bottle with the gas? Maybe we have. It's maybe. <laughs> maybe the game is so linear that you have to do it in a particular order. So like bottle combine, combine with the gas. Uh, and so now I've got a bottle with gas in it. And that's moved the rag around. Can I select the rag now? I can select the rag. That was the problem. <laughs> okay, let's use the item. Buggy, buggy uh, game. Uh, let's use the item. And so now there's this cutscene where we give the salesman our rag. And we get the greasy rag back, the oily rag. So now in our inventory, we've got this oily rag. And we're going to combine that with our bottle with gasoline and then you get a bottle with gas uh, with the rag in it which is a Molotov cocktail and now if we give the dynamite now there's a lot of explosion here I've got dynamite and a Molotov cocktail I'm pretty sure we have to give the dynamite to um, Pete the pyro he wants dynamite if I remember correctly, but we, cause we need to use the Molotov cocktail tail ourselves. Um, so if I go in inventory dynamite, I can't choose three again. Oh, that's garbage. Uh, different item bottle. I can't use that here. 
It's like three is broken. Three is broken. Um, different item. Oily rag. Oh, I've still got the oily rag. Combine with. Combine with two. Bottle with gas. Now I've got dynamite set to two. Examine. It's a bottle with gas inside. It's supposed to be a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> All right, but now that I've moved the inventory, there, I've got the dynamite. I may have made this game unwinnable now um, by somehow losing the rag. <laughs> uh, we'll see. So we're going to give Pete the Pyro this, uh, this dynamite, and now we've got this lighter, and now he's going to blow up himself with some dynamite. That's great. Great job, me. Okay, and some blitting problem there. I don't know why there's that issue. Okay, so in our inventory, we've got this bottle with gas. Can I combine it with the lighter? Combine now with the lighter. No. We may have made this game impossible to beat. Um, but let's keep walking around. Let's just make sure that there's nothing else we can do here. Walk past the store. Yeah, there's this wishing well, and there's this person at the end. Guardian Fred, what you doing? What you guarding? Uh, I'm guarding the treasure of Vanderen Island. You look tired. What really am is thirsty, and that stupid well is bone dry. Can I go by? Nope, I have my orders. No one is to go by. See ya. I remember now. We've got to use the Molotov cocktail, presuming we've got one. I don't think we do. I think we somehow lost it by losing the uh, greasy rag. We need to blow up the ice with the Molotov cocktail to create water and then put it in the souvenir mug. <laughs> this is the logic. This is the logic of the game. Now, I can't remember where the ice salesperson, salesman is. Where is the ice salesman? I think they might be over here. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we can if use the Molotov cocktail. Nope. And we lost our... Uh, we lost our, uh, um, we, we lost our rag. So this game is now unwinnable. Too bad. Too bad. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Maybe there's a way, there's definitely a way of winning it. It's probable that you have to like do the steps in the walkthrough in exactly that order, um, in order to win the game. So I'm sorry we, we didn't complete it, but if I remember correctly, there was like a, uh, there was like a gag at the end where you have to use the, um, you blow up the, the ice, you get the water, you put it in the mug, you give it to the guard, the guard takes the key, the, he's got a key to a door that's behind him, but he throws it down this wishing well, and you have the will, the, I don't remember, I don't remember, there's some, some, is in the walkthrough? Is it in the walkthrough? Uh, oily rag in the bottle. Bottle. You have to use the oily rag in the bottle. That was probably the problem, is that you have to combine the oily rag into the bottle, then the bottle with the rag and the gas, and that gets the Molotov cocktail. Use the mug. Go back to the store. Uh, go right. Go right. Use the mug of water. Watch the cutscene. Go right. Open the fish. There's a fish and use the key inside the fish and that's it uh doug this is from doug who's one of my friends right so if you want to play this game it's available you can play it here it's on github you can watch it to completion i'm just going to close this out actually i wonder i guess there's a way of saving the game um i wonder what would happen if we saved the game and tried to reload it so how do you save the game is there in the controls here does it say Save, save. How to play. We don't even say how to save the game. Um, is there a menu? Save. Load. Load map, load tiles, load. I'll bet you that load game was like just wishful thinking. 
Yeah, I don't think there's a way of saving a game. All right, we're going to close right there. Hey, thank you so much for watching episode blah, 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 273 of The Joy of Coding. I hope that was interesting. A little walk down memory lane. We're straight into the 90s. You know, uh, we're looking at Code Rush. We saw an old QBasic game that my friends and I wrote over many, many months, maybe even a year and more uh, when I was a kid. Very cringy. Uh, and we also had a Moxie Fruvis reference. That's wild. But I'm going to cap it there. Hey, thanks again for watching episode 273 of The Joy of Coding. Thanks for being here with me during, uh, you know, pandemic and all, all this stuff. Next year, uh, next episode will be uh, mid-January. I think it's like January 15th or something in 2022. So I will see you there. It'll be on a Wednesday as per usual. Um, yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to it. So I hope all of you who are watching, you have yourself a great winter holiday if you're taking one. Or if you're somehow where south of the equator, you have a great summer holiday. Um, and, uh, and I'll see you in the new year. Happy new year. Take care. Bye-bye. Hang on. Got to play the outro music. The joy of coding. See ya.